And I'm going to show you two different scenarios here. One is where you have your inverter located right next to your battery. And we're just going to say that we have a three foot cable between your inverter and your battery. That's about as short as what's usually practical in most applications. But a lot of people like to have their inverter connected to, say, in their pickup. They want it connected to the electrical system, wired right up to the battery. And they want the inverter inside the cab or somewhere safe and dry because that's where you want it. You don't want it under your hood. That's a terrible idea. So in that case, you may need a much longer set of cables. Uh, let's just say 15 feet that you need 15 feet of cabling to get from your battery to where you want to install your inverter. So I'm going to look at those two scenarios, 3 feet and 15 feet. When you connect your battery to your inverter, there's going to be some voltage drop in the cabling that goes between them. Now, if it's 3 feet between your battery and the inverter, you'll have a certain amount of voltage drop. If it's 15 feet between them, 15 is 5 times greater than 3, so you will have five times the voltage drop. And that's why the distance matters. It doesn't matter for heating purposes because it's a power loss per unit length of the cabling. The length doesn't really change that uh, heating effect, but it does change the voltage drop. And if you have a longer run, you may need heavier cables for that reason. So we know what wire gauge we want to use. We know what surge current the inverter requires. We know what length of wire that we want to use and we know what the resistance of that wire is per foot. We have all the information we need to calculate if the voltage drop with our setup is acceptable. Now the question becomes, what's acceptable, right? Well, it's between a quarter volt and half a volt uh, is what's acceptable, and it really does depend on a lot of different factors. I'm going to use the one half a volt threshold. Uh, really, for a good install, you should keep it down to 0 0.2, 0 0.25 volts, but for the purposes of this, I'm going, to, I'm going to select one half volt as our threshold for what's acceptable. And you do not want to go above one half volt. That's the upper limit of what's uh, practical. So let's see if our three foot setup is acceptable. Our wire is 0 0.00016 <coughs> ohms per foot. That's 0.16 milli ohms. And we have three feet of cabling. So we'll multiply that by three and there's a positive and a negative cable, so we have to multiply that by two. So really we have six feet of cabling. Now there is going to be some voltage drop in the connections as well. I'm going to ignore that. Uh, it's probably 0.2 volts additional that's going to be lost in the connections on top of that one half volt, but we'll ignore that for the purposes of this discussion. So here is our resistance of the wire. About one milliohm is our six feet of two gauge cable. So one milliohm times 200 amps. And that's our inverter surge requirement. That gives us 0.2 volts, which is very good. So for a three foot cable, this setup will work great. All we need to do is get six feet of two gauge wire, cut it in half, put ends on it, and we're ready to go. Now, what if we have this same two gauge cable, but we want it to locate it 15 feet away from the battery? So now we have our resistance times 15 feet <coughs> times 2 for the positive and negative and it gives us this much resistance total times 200 amps and look at that we have 1 volt which is totally unacceptable this inverter will not function properly with 2 gauge cables at 15 feet and I'm not going to go through the math here but if you do go through the math, you'll find that you need 2 aught cabling. Now, 30 feet of 2 aught cable is extremely expensive, so it's pretty obvious just from this example here why you want to locate your inverter as close as possible. So, we've got it all figured out. We know how long the cable has to be. We know what gauge of cable to use. What more do we need? Well, you got to buy the cable. So, what kind of 2 gauge cable do we buy? And this is the part where a lot of people get into trouble because many industries out there aren't very well regulated and particularly if you buy jumper cables to use that wiring or buy something that's advertised for audio purposes, you're highly unlikely to get what you think you bought. A lot of times jumper cables are outright lies. They'll say it's a certain gauge and it won't be. 
a lot of these are Chinese origin and lots of these businesses just aren't very reputable and they simply give you a product that you didn't pay for you paid for more than you got and that's pretty common so you want to be very careful if you use jumper cables uh, it's best to buy those in the store where you can inspect them beforehand if you buy them online make sure to check the reviews and make sure that someone has actually measured it and that you're getting what you think you're buying and the other one that I mentioned was audio cable it's very common in the audio wiring industry because audio is an art not a science um, you don't really need the cabling that people think you need for it so a lot of times if it's say zero gauge audio wire zero gauge means the insulation is zero gauge the wire inside may be significantly thinner so I would say stay away from audio cabling certainly don't get low oxygen cable it's a complete waste of money uh, there's multiple places to get it but uh, particularly in those two cases beware now if you buy household type wiring that's well regulated you will always get what you pay for however there's other trade-offs involved there so if you always get what you pay for with household wiring why wouldn't you just always buy it you can go to any hardware store and get it right well for one you usually can't get anything thicker than about six gauge without special ordering it uh, or if you can it's usually available in uh, aluminum and not copper you do want copper uh, but there's another reason for it the strand count is pretty pathetic this is six gauge household wiring it's way too stiff to be practical in addition to that the strand count is very low if you try to crimp something onto it like I've done here this crimp isn't very isn't a very good crimp uh, it has a high resistance connection this is likely to overheat you want a very high strand count to get a good crimp and you just can't get that on a low strand count wiring like this and uh, let me quick count the strands here this only has seven strands which makes it extremely stiff and there's another complication to this too if it's installed in a location where it frequently bends the thick wire especially copper can only bend a few times before the strands start breaking internally and you'll get a high resistance point in your wire which can be a fire hazard or reliability concern so you can use household wiring I'm not going to say don't do it but be, be aware of those complications and I think just from uh, the point of working with the wire something like this which is very cheap wire but it's a higher strand count is much much better so I would not recommend using household wiring now when I say be careful when you buy jumper cables if you plan on cutting those apart and using them or because you like the clamps on the ends and it's the cheapest way to get them then uh, don't I'm not saying don't buy jumper cables for example this is an AutoCraft 20 foot 4 gauge jumper cable I bought this specifically to cut apart and it actually is 4 gauge so you get 40 feet of 4 gauge wire and this is true 4 gauge high strand count good quality copper the insulation seems pretty decent this is a good set of jumper cables but a lot of them aren't a lot of times when you think you bought 4 gauge you actually get something more like 8 and that would be disastrous if you tried to use that with your inverter you can easily cause fires or it just won't work well so be very careful and uh, in this example I bought it and cut it apart I used them both conductors together like this and uh, when you parallel up induct conductors like this two conductors of four gauge equals one gauge wire so I made a one gauge battery strap and it works well for me that is an option for you however there's other options out there too some of the best quality wire that you can get is welding cable welding cable is very expensive and I don't like spending a lot of money on stuff so I typically don't get welding cable uh, what I have done aside from these jumper cables is to buy things online uh, since that seems to be the least expensive place I found to get decent quality and inexpensive wiring but if you do buy something online you have to be really careful because a lot of times it's not what it's advertised to be so look at the reviews that's the best place to start make sure that somebody in the reviews has checked it and said that this is the correct wire but that doesn't mean the manufacturer won't switch it on you and ship you something inferior so whatever you get make sure you check it so that you know what gauge it really is now I wanted some two gauge wire to make some battery connections so I bought this two gauge wire from a online vendor the review said that it was true two gauge so I was pretty confident that this would be okay it seems to be pretty good quality wire it has a high strand count and it does appear to be two gauge but before I use this I do want to verify and make sure that I got what I paid for because if I didn't 
I'm returning this and the manufacturer is going to pay return shipping because I would be pissed. So the first thing you want to do is uncoil this and measure it. And that's exactly what I've done here. I put one end under this, pulled it out straight on my carpet here, ran a tape measure along, and I got what I paid for. This is the red one. I bought both a red and a black pair. And this is 10 feet of wire, plus or minus an inch or so. So the length is correct. And the next thing I want to do is to grab my digital scale. This happens to be a shipping scale. You can just as easily use a kitchen scale or whatever else you happen to weigh. Don't worry, I won't tell anybody. And I know that from that wire gauge table, that 10 feet of two gauge cable should weigh about two pounds. Now, the insulation and such has weight to it also. Um, so you're just going to have to estimate based on the insulation thickness, how much of the weight is copper and how much is insulation. Uh, but uh, in any case, if this weighs less than two pounds, I know I got ripped off for sure. So I'm going to put that on the scale, and it's two pounds, seven ounces, which is very good. Seven ounces of insulation seems pretty reasonable, and I got what I paid for. This is true two-gauge wire. I also want to make sure and look at it, make sure that the copper isn't oxidized heavily, make sure it's not aluminum or something, because that would really be bad. And if you don't have a scale or want to double check, what you can also do is take a tape measure and measure the diameter of the copper inside. Now keep in mind, on a fine strand count wire like this, the diameter will be quite a bit larger than the ideal diameter in a AWG table because there's a lot of air in between these different strands. Uh, when they make wire like this, they make it round, so round things don't fit together evenly. There's a bunch of little spaces in there. So you can't go strictly off of the diameter unless you know exactly how many strands this is and happen to find somewhere online how what diameter a round bundle of that many strands of whatever gauge wire it is ends up being. Uh, but the most reliable way is just to weigh it. But you can estimate from the diameter as well. So there you have it. We select a wire that handles the thermal load, that handles the proper voltage droop, and we verified that the wire is the proper gauge. So I'm not going to cover the connections or anything like that in this video, but that is how you select wire for hooking up an inverter to a battery, or really any battery-powered uh, application. Now, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of manuals and such, that just say, use this wire, use this length. I don't like those approaches. You really need to determine what's best for your application, because everyone's a little bit different. And if you just follow the manufacturer's instructions, you may not end up with a safe product, you may spend more money than you need to spend, and it may not work as well as you think that it should. So, go through this process, do the math, and select the proper wire, and verify that you actually received what you think you bought. That's my recommendation, and this is how I select wiring. And one more thing before I go. This video is maybe a little bit different than some of the videos that I have been making, in that I'm not actually working on a project, I'm just giving some information. And let me know if you like this sort of thing, either give me a thumbs up or thumbs down, either way. And if enough people like this sort of thing, maybe I'll make some more. So, thank you for watching.